Good afternoon, everyone. Just a few things for you, and then I'll get right to your questions. Uh, so first, uh, Secretary Austin began his day today with two phone calls this morning uh, with his counterparts from Qatar and Sweden. Uh, he spoke first with Qatar's Minister of State of Defense Affairs, His Excellency Dr. Khalid Mohammed al Atia. The two discussed our shared commitment to our close defense partnership and to ensuring stability across the Middle East region. Shortly afterwards, Secretary Austin spoke with Sweden's Minister of Defense, Paul Johnson. The Secretary looks forward to continuing our shared efforts with Sweden, to providing security assistance to Ukraine, and to working together next week in Germany at the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. Readouts of these two engagements will be posted to defense.gov. Separately, Secretary Austin also attended a memorial service earlier today at the Washington National Cathedral for former Secretary of Defense, Dr. Ash Carter. Secretary Austin again offers his condolences and prayers to the family of Dr. Carter, a leader whose commitment and service to the DOD and to our nation will long be remembered. And later this afternoon, Secretary Austin will host Japan's Minister of Defense, Hamada, to the Pentagon for an honor Koran and bilateral meeting. The Secretary looks forward to welcoming the Minister and to continuing their important discussion following yesterday's two plus two consultative talks. We will also post a readout of today's meeting on the DOD website once it's available. And then finally, today the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released their unclassified version of the annual Unidentified Aerial Phenomena or UAP report required by the National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year 2022. The report is available on the ODNI website, but you can also find the link on our DOD press release, uh, which we put out a short while ago and which is also posted on defense.gov. And with that, I will take your questions. We'll start with AP, Tara. Um, two on Ukraine. Can you give us a status update on what uh, the department is seeing in Solidar? Uh, you know, is there a chance that Russian forces will take it? Um, and secondly, uh, there are reports today that uh, a Russian general visited Belarus and visited troops in Belarus. Um, what are the Pentagon's insights into this? What are your concerns that there might be a spring offensive that Belarus is supporting? Yeah, sure. Um, in, in terms of Solidar, uh, we do continue to see intense and heavy fighting around Solidar uh, and Bakhmut, which of course is uh, uh, relatively close. Uh, we cannot corroborate any reports that uh, Solidar has been taken by Russian forces. We did see some press reporting on that. Uh, in particular, uh, those forces led by the, the Wagner Group. Um, but we do know that uh, the Ukrainians continue to uh, operate in the vicinity uh, of Solidar uh, and continue to fight back. So in the meantime, our focus obviously remains on continuing to, to work with Ukraine and the international community to get Ukraine the security assistance that it needs. In terms of Belarus, um, you know, it is an area that we continue to keep a close eye on. We do know that Russian forces uh, have conducted exercises uh, with Belarus forces, uh, but at this time, no indication of any type of offensive action uh, that looks imminent. But again, we'll continue to closely monitor. So you haven't seen any additional movements of troops or equipment that might raise concern into Belarus? Uh, nothing at this stage that I would consider concerning. Thank you. Tom. Uh, Pat, on Ukraine, can you give us a sense when those Bradley fighting vehicles will arrive in Ukraine? And also, there's a lot of talk among the Brits and the Germans uh, and the Poles about sending tanks to Ukraine. Can you talk about the Pentagon's discussions with the allies on that point? Sure. Uh, in terms of the Bradley fighting vehicles, while I'm, I'm not going to provide a specific date, uh, as, as we've mentioned before, those vehicles will um, go to Germany first so that the Ukrainians can train on them as part of the combined arms uh, and joint maneuver training that we're conducting. Okay, ballpark when that will happen. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, weeks, not months, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, and then, I'm sorry, your second question? The tanks. On the tanks. So, uh, broadly speaking, again, uh, whether it's tanks, whether it's air defense, uh, whether it's artillery, uh, these are all areas that we continue to discuss closely with our international allies and partners. Uh, as you know, we've got the Ukraine Defense Contact Group coming up next week, and so I fully expect that this will be an area for further discussion. The, the Brits and the Germans, the Poles, have already talked about the tanks. 
Can you give us a sense of the Pentagon's position of this? Are they supportive of this? Is this something separate that those countries will do? Yeah, no, we're absolutely supportive of any type of defense capabilities that our international allies uh, and partners can provide to Ukraine to include tanks. Again, uh, part of the factor, uh, the equation that goes into that is the ability to train on this equipment, sustain it, uh, and maintain it. And so that will be a part of any discussion, whether it's the United States or our, our partners. Um, but certainly we are supportive of any type of capability that will give the Ukrainians an advantage on the battlefield. And lastly, Abrams part of that discussion? Uh, f again, for the United States, uh, I don't have anything new to announce. We're going to continue to have the discussions in terms of what we can do to best assist Ukraine. Janie. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I have two questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. The South Korean <coughs> President Yoon Suk yeol said it clear that South Korea could build uh, its own nuclear armament. What is the U.S. position on this? Uh, thanks, Jenny. Uh, I've seen the, the press reports on that. It's really something for the Republic of Korea to address. I would tell you that from a U.S. standpoint, our policy continues to remain focused on the complete denuclearization of the, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and I'm working, as always, with our ROK J Japanese and allies in the region uh, to preserve security and stability, uh, and importantly, to deter aggression from countries like North Korea. Uh, as we've said before, and as you know, we have nearly 30,000 U.S. forces uh, stationed in South Korea alone that are focused on supporting and defending our, our ROK allies. Uh, so our commitment towards this end remains ironclad. But look, uh, North Korea and China, Russia have nuclear weapons, and then South Korea, Japan do not. Uh, there is a lot of public opinion that nuclear armament is necessary in order to be free from North Korean nuclear weapons. But why not? Why cannot have nuclear weapons? Uh, again, uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact from a, a regional security and stability standpoint and non-proliferation in terms of preventing uh, the potential chance for the uh, use of nuclear weapons. And so from a United States perspective, again, our policy remains very clear on denuclearization, but it's important also to remember that the Republic of Korea falls under that extended deterrence umbrella. And so uh, in addition to the U.S. forces uh, that are assigned there on the peninsula, uh, our allies in the region to include South Korea are, are part of that. If uh, uh, the U.S. nuclear umbrella, nuclear umbrella doesn't work. Well, now we're getting into hypotheticals and, and speculating. And so I would say uh, that to date, it has worked and it's worked very well. So let me go ahead and move on. Randy. Thank you, sir. Um, on the 2022 UAP report, um, there's 366 reports since July 2022. The majority of those originate from U.S. Navy and Air Force aviators and operators who witnessed them during their operational duties and reported them to the previous task force and now Arrow through official channels. What are those official channels that the Pentagon has um, set up for better information sharing on this topic? Yeah, thanks very much for the question. Uh, so first of all, let me just say right up top that um, the department wants to thank the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for leading the collaborative effort to produce this report, as well as all the other agencies that, that supported it. Uh, I would encourage you to, as I'm sure you are, uh, read that report uh, for any type of detailed information. Uh, broadly speaking, when it comes to the types of processes and procedures that have been established, uh, the, the Arrow Office, as you highlighted, um, has closely worked with each of the service branches to come up with a streamlined reporting system to be able to, to collect that information. Uh, and then in addition to the military branches is also working with the interagency. So uh, organizations like NOAA, the Coast Guard, Department of the Energy, just to name a few. Uh, and so by establishing those reporting procedures, what it does, and I think you'll see this in the report, is it allows the collection of data and more data allows us to be a little bit more rigorous in terms of how we go after investigating these incidents. So hopefully that 
that. Yeah, it does. And I appreciate the transparency here. Just a quick follow-up. Um, the report says that regarding health concerns, so far no encounters of UAP have been aligned with serious um, anomalous health incidents. Congress uh, pushed you guys and mandated ODNI and the Pentagon to look into that, which means there were reports from military aviators about anomalous health incidents. Is there anything you guys can share about what those health incidents ended up being if they were not UAP. Yeah, I don't I don't have any information to provide. I'd encourage you to take a look at the report. I would say broadly speaking, uh, I think one of the key points in this report, you know, given given the potential uh, hazard that UAPs do present, notably there's been no reported collisions of of uh, military aircraft or US aircraft rather uh, and UAPs, um, but in terms of those specifics, I'd I'd refer you back to the report. Let me go to Nancy and then we'll go over here to um, Felicia. One um, follow-up question from yesterday. If there's a way by the end of the week, if we could get a sense of other places where Ukrainian forces have trained in the United States and a rough estimate of how many they've trained, that would be very helpful. And then there are reports that um, Kathy Chung, who works as the Deputy Director of Protocol for the Secretary of <coughs> uh, Austin, has been interviewed as part of the um, FBI investigation into some of these classified documents found um, with President Biden. Can you give us a sense, um, if you at, at all, about what kinds of, um, how many times she's been interviewed, whether those interviews have happened at the Pentagon, and whether she retains her current position as the Deputy Director of Protocol? Thanks, Nancy. Uh, on your first question, absolutely. I know we owe you that answer and, and we're working to get that for you. Um, so we will aim to, to try to provide something to you in the press corps before the end of the week. Um, in regards to the, uh, the documents that you're referring to and any type of FBI action, I, I really need to refer you to the Department of Justice. I'm not gonna have any comment on that. Uh, in terms of Ms. Chung, she does remain employed by the Department of Defense, uh, currently serving as the Deputy Director of Protocol. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try once more on tanks. Um, Germany and Poland have talked about sending main battle tanks as part of an international coalition or effort. Um, can that coalition or that effort happen without the U.S. sending Abrams? Are there, how are you looking to, because yes. Germany, yes, it can happen. The, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, it, yes, it can happen. I'm gonna make sure uh, of that. course. I mean, you already have an international coalition pri providing a variety of military capabilities to Ukraine. Uh, and so, uh, again, I think, um, you know, an important point here, uh, and, and again, I, I don't mean to come across as, as flippant. I mean, I, I understand your question. Um, and as, as we've said, we're going to continue to keep all options on the table. Uh, when it comes to the capabilities that we provide to Ukraine. But again, I don't have anything to announce regarding tanks or uh, Abrams today. But but on international capabilities um, and how we bring them together, I think this is part of the discussion and part of the training that you see already taking place uh, in places like Europe to enable the Ukrainians to train on these systems uh, and then employ them effectively on the battlefield. And one of the things that Secretary Austin has made very clear, both publicly and privately, is I can give you equipment, I can, you know, uh, and I can give you the training, and I'm providing you with the capability. And that's really what we're talking about when it comes to the combined arms employment of these capabilities in a way that's going to assist Ukraine. One follow-up. You sure. said earlier that you, the, the U.S. supports um, Germany and others that want to send tanks, um, but ahead of the meetings next week, are you encouraging them to send main battle tanks? So I'm not going to I'm not going to necessarily preview the specifics uh, of what we're going to encourage them. Uh, again, Secretary Austin and other DoD leaders and other you know members of the U.S. government are constantly engaged with our allies and partners around the world to discuss how we can all collectively best support Ukraine. Um, and, and, you know, I don't necessarily want to say uh, it, it's a sovereign decision for each country what they can or cannot provide. Uh, and so, again, uh, to, to clarify, what I'm saying is we, we certainly support and are encouraged by any effort to support Ukraine, uh, whether that's training or whether that's physical equipment. The important point being we're all doing it together uh, to help this country defend itself. Let me go out to the phone here real quick and then I'll come back in the room. Uh, Liz from Fox. Hey, thanks for taking my question. Can you hear me okay? Here you go. Great. 
Um, so I have a few questions regarding um, counter drone capabilities. The first one is um, how many drones can one vampire system target at the same time? The second one is how will the system be being sent to Ukraine, how will it fight Ukraine in its fight against Russia? Um, and the third one is a little bit broader. Um, as enemies of the U.S. are increasing their use of drones, does the U.S. have adequate systems to defend against these drones, including a possible swarm of a, of a drone attack, say, on a NATO ally or Ukraine? Thanks, Liz. Um, I'll, I'll come back on your last question because I just want to make sure I understood what you asked correctly. The, the first two on the vampire system. Uh, for operation security reasons, I'm not going to get into the the specifics in terms of its, um, you know, the the number of drones it can or cannot effectively guard against. Uh, as you do highlight, it is an anti-drone capability, uh, and once provided to Ukraine, uh, that will be integrated into its broader air defense capability, its integrated air defense system, so to speak, uh, as as part of that multi-layered defense capability to protect it from aerial attacks uh, to include drones. And then I think your your last question was, um, is can the U.S. adequately protect against drone attacks? Was that what you were asking? Yeah. How, how confident is the U.S. as um, the U.S.'s enemies are developing their drone capabilities in defense? Yeah, so I, I would say uh, that, you know, largely speaking, this is an area of continued uh, development, continued research development and execution. We, we clearly maintain a capability, a counter drone, counter UAS capability. Um, that said, you know, I, I think we've all seen how these, uh, you know, these drones, these capabilities can be used uh, in a variety of ways in a variety of creative and unique ways on the battlefield. And so it's one of those things that we're going to have to continue to stay after. Uh, you've seen everything from high end drones to uh, terrorist organizations, you know, using them to drop hand grenades on uh, frontline formations in, in places like Iraq and Syria. So uh, that is an area that we're going to continue to, to work closely on. Broadly speaking, though, yes, I, I remain confident uh, that we do have the capabilities to defend our forces, uh, no matter where they're serving. Thank you. Let me just go to one more here. Patrick Tucker, Defense One. Hey, thanks for doing this. Uh, yesterday, Navy Secretary Carlos Del Toro uh, made a comment that if the uh, industrial defense base doesn't ramp up production, it's going to be challenging for uh, the U.S. to continue to, to arm itself. Uh, he, he basically said if the conflict does go on for another six months, for another year, it certainly continues to stress the supply chain in many ways that are challenging, uh, is his direct quote. Uh, is that the Pentagon's view that if the Ukraine conflict goes on at its current pace and, and the support mission goes on at its current pace, that the U.S. will face challenges in uh, adequately arming itself? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Pat. Um, so as you've heard Secretary Austin say before, we will not go below our readiness requirements as we take into consideration what Ukraine's uh, security assistance needs are. And so uh, as we as we work with them and as we work with our partners to identify the specific capabilities, the specific systems uh, among the capabilities that we have, uh, there's going to be a variety of factors that are taken into account uh, to ensure that we can continue to support Ukraine while at the same time ensuring that we maintain our own readiness and our own stocks. Um, you know, importantly, uh, this has been an ongoing conversation and an ongoing effort uh, from very early on in this campaign, particularly as we saw it going out uh, for for a uh, extended period. And so you've seen things like uh, the National Armaments Directors meeting regularly. In fact, they'll meet next week uh, prior to the Defense Contact Group, Ukraine Defense Contact Group. Uh, and, and they have a, a series of regular meetings so that we can continue to work as an international community to, to do, again, one, uh, make sure that we're anticipating and supporting Ukraine and its needs, uh, but also making sure that we can uh, maintain and replenish our own stocks of munitions. 
And so uh, we are confident uh, that we can continue on that glide path, working very closely with industry and working with our international allies and partners. I would say it's one of our great strategic strengths as a coalition is the fact that we do have such a large uh, defense and number of defense industrial bases to draw upon, as well as a motivated uh, defense industrial base that wants to help us in that regard. So we are confident that we'll continue to be able to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. And we're confident that we'll be able to continue to maintain the readiness levels that are vital to defending our nation. Thank you. Carla. I just want a quick clarification on what you were telling Tom about the Bradleys. Um, when you say we're looking at weeks, not months, do you mean weeks for their arrival in Germany and for training to begin, or do you mean so, weeks, not months for yeah, them so, to get to Ukraine? So training uh, training should start, uh, for the most part, uh, my understanding is next week in Germany. Okay. Uh, and so on, on, the, on the joint maneuver training, combined arms training, Bradley's, it should start next week in Germany. Um, in terms of, again, specific dates, uh, you'll see the rallies arrive in the battlefield when they arrive, and we'll allow Ukraine to, to highlight that. Uh, I'm saying that, you know, again, we anticipate that that training will take weeks, not months, but I'm not going to get into the specific numbers of, of weeks or months. So thank you. Okay. Oren. Uh, what is the U.S. assessment of, of the change at the top of the Russian military, uh, General Valer Valery Gerasimov becoming not only the chief of defense, but also the chief of the so-called special military operation and, and Surovikin becoming his deputy. Is that a sign of just more dysfunction there or displeasure with, with either Surovikin or Gerasimov? And, and what does that say to the U.S. about Prigozhin's position at this time and Wagner? Yeah, um, so certainly aware of Russia's announcement uh, regarding the, the personnel shift, uh, and it's something that we continue to monitor, Oren. I'm not going to speculate per se on how this might affect things on the battlefield in Ukraine, other than to say that it likely does reflect uh, some of the systemic challenges that the Russian military has faced since the beginning of this invasion. And we've talked about some of those things in terms of um, its uh, logistics problems, uh, command and control problems, sustainment problems, morale, uh, and large the largely uh, large failure to achieve the strategic objectives that they've set for themselves. Um, so it's something that we'll continue to keep an eye on. I, I would say, frankly, uh, I think that the world would rather see Russia focus on withdrawing from Ukraine and saving innocent lives versus spending time on numerous uh, management reshuffles. Uh, and Russian soldiers and their families would probably like to see that too. But other than that, nothing else to provide. Thank you. Will. Two questions. Um, so the U.S. has provided a, a variety of uh, counter UAV capabilities to Ukraine. Um, is, is there a mechanism for assessing how well they work and, and kind of the Ukrainians feeding that back to the U.S.? And if so, what, what has the U.S. learned from that so far, if such a thing exists? Um, well, I don't, I don't want to get into uh, specific effectiveness rates other than to say I think the results largely do speak for themselves. Uh, the, the Ukrainians have talked publicly about their air defense abilities and their success rate in terms of taking down, for example, Iranian drones, taking down uh, Russian missiles. And, um, and, and I would say that from a U.S. perspective, uh, that is accurate. They have done a very good job. Uh, using the air defense capabilities that they had originally and then integrating, uh, you know, Western capabilities into their system to, to do that. That said, clearly, uh, Russian missiles and, and drones continue to have an impact. And so we, we will do our part to continue to support them, to provide them with additional air defense capabilities. Without getting into what what specifically has worked and how well it has worked, but is 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 what's working in Ukraine kind of being incorporated by the U.S. and into into its planning for for kind of UA, uh, UAS? Um, so I would say that any time uh, there's a significant conflict, the United States military, as a learning organization, is going to uh, observe um, what works and what doesn't work on the battlefield and try to apply those lessons learned into our own joint doctrine and, and training. So uh, I think that the situation in Ukraine is no different. Tom. Hi, thanks, sir. Uh, two, two different questions. One, uh, a few briefings ago, uh, before the defense bill was passed, one of my colleagues here asked about the, the possible impact uh, uh, of the vaccine mandate being taken away, which it has been now, on the ability to send troops into countries that require 
the mandate. I wonder if you could consider bringing it back in response to that at some point, if it would impact our troops going into countries that require a vaccine mandate. So, um, I have a second question. yeah, so cer certainly uh, commanders do have a responsibility to ensure that if they're sending forces uh, to a place that, that requires uh, a vaccine that that's a situation that will be uh, addressed, you know, on a case by case okay. basis. Um, but you know, we have a responsibility for the health and welfare of our forces, uh, and so, you know, again, depending on the situation and the circumstances, uh, it's incumbent on commanders to to ensure that they're doing what they need to do to make sure those forces are ready. So the decision, basically, generally speaking, would be at the that level. Correct. Okay. My second question is. Uh, uh, the British uh, military put out a statement today how it's tracking the new Russian aircraft carrier that's in the North Sea. And it said that uh, they're tracking it, it's a task force tracking it with NATO allies. Is the United States participating in that? Uh, I don't have an answer to that, Tom. I, I just don't know. I'd recommend you contact uh, UCOM and they may be able to provide you some additional insight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris. Uh, two questions. Uh, first, we've talked a lot about tanks. Bradley's uh, combined arms training that enables um, the Ukrainians to effectively fight. But one thing the U.S. does is when it goes to war, it has a lot of air power. So is there going to be any discussion about among all the members of the defense contact group about providing Ukraine with fixed wing aircraft? Uh, so, so I think as I mentioned before, you know, the, the primary focus of the upcoming contact group will largely be on air defense and armor. Um, that said, again, broadly speaking, uh, as an international coalition and certainly within the Department of Defense, we continue to look at the near, medium and long term defense requirements for Ukraine. Uh, and so uh, while I don't have any announcements to make in regards to aircraft at this time, you know, certainly we'll continue to, to take a look at the situation and consider Ukraine's security assistance needs. And then the, uh, my second question is, um, yesterday the U.S. and Japan uh, said they committed to expand joint shared use of U.S. and Japanese facilities, um, but it was not more specific than that. Um, could that include increased ability for the U.S. Air Force to operate from Japanese air, force, air bases, or, or what does that entail a little more explicitly if you can? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have more details to provide in the future as the U.S. military and Japanese uh, self-defense force staffs work together uh, on those details. Um, as you do highlight, um, you know, without getting into specifics, whether it's the United States Marine Corps, whether it's the United States Air Force, the Army and others taking advantage of opportunities to to be able to position forces throughout the Indo-Pacific uh, region in a distributed way that provides us with agility, flexibility, uh, and and maneuverability to be able to respond to any regional threats. But this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, ongoing conversation. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, so we've we've seen in the last uh, number of weeks, Bradley, several different kinds of armored vehicles are going to be uh, donated to Ukraine. Um, we're talking about different kinds of uh, tanks potentially going to uh, Ukraine. Um, the Secretary of Defense leads the contact group. What's his level of concern or confidence in Ukraine's ability to sustain all these various types of vehicles, um, you know, simultaneously? And is that a, to what degree is that a factor in in decisions about um, providing them with more types of equipment? Yeah, well, I mean, again, kind of going back to what I said earlier, broadly speaking, um, logistics and sustainment is a factor in decisions about providing Ukraine with capabilities, not because we don't want to give it to them, but because, you know, something that you can't operate isn't going to help you um, and, you know, could potentially um, give you a disadvantage. Um, that said, to your point, integrating all of these capabilities uh, is a priority uh, and it's part of the ongoing conversation and, and collaboration in terms of how we train the Ukrainians, um, whether it's, um, you know, uh, collective training or individual training on those systems. So that is part of the discussion is how once those capabilities are put back into Ukraine, 
how they can best employ them together in a combined arms approach. All that said, I, I would also not underestimate um, what we've seen the Ukrainians do time and time again, which is take these systems and uh, employ them in a way that's been extremely effective under incredibly trying circumstances. So um, th there is that there is that X factor as well um, that they've been demonstrating since this invasion began. Can I have a uh, follow up on Pat Tucker's question earlier sure. about um, readiness levels? I think we've heard a number of times from different defense officials, um, yourself, that the um, that that uh, leaders here aren't going to allow um, you know stocks to fall below a certain readiness level or, or what's required. But are those requirements static over the last year, or is that um, is that an like a rolling assessment? And have those assess you know have those um, assessments changed over time? Have there, have, uh, have folks here um, grown to accept more risk because of changing conditions? Yeah, so I'm not, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I'm not going to get into specific um, systems and units and readiness and things like that, other than to say, again, I, I meant what I said, that that is part of the discussion uh, in terms of as things are considered, there is, there is always uh, a lot of input and um, deliberation in terms of, okay, if we provide this, what would the impact be on our forces, on our alliance? Uh, and, and again, the secretary has been very clear that we're not going to do anything that's going to prevent us from meeting our security commitments worldwide. And so, uh, again, you know, Russia invading Ukraine has prevent has presented a significant challenge, not only you, to Ukraine, but to the international rules based order. And so I think everyone collectively worldwide understands the importance of this task and the fact that um, we've all got to work together to make sure that we can sustain the support to Ukraine because of the consequences if we don't. And so, again, as, as I highlighted before, I think we're very confident that we have the the relationships, we have the network, uh, and we have the capability and capacity worldwide to work together to ensure that we can meet Ukraine's security assistance needs, while at the same time working very closely together to make sure we can meet our own national defense requirements. Thank you. All right, let me just do a few more, sir. Hi, Peter Martin from Bloomberg News. Um, I wondered if I could follow up on the, the M1 question again. Um, and, and specifically, you talked about the importance of logistics and sustainment. How do you see that? How, did, how does that impact Pentagon thinking on whether or not to provide the M1 to the Ukrainians? Do you think that's something they could effectively integrate into their operations or that it would simply be too complex? Um, so, uh, you know, without again trying to... So again, first of all, I'm not going to have any announcement to make. Let me just say that again. I'm not sure if you knew that. But um, the, the M1 is a uh, logistics uh, and, and fuel intensive vehicle. Okay. So, um, that certainly is part of the equation. Um, but again, we will continue to move as we move forward, we'll continue to keep all options on the table. Um, but you know, like we were just talking about, you've got to take into account if I'm going to provide you with a piece of equipment, are you going to be able to sustain it, maintain it, operate it, fuel it? Uh, and is it going to be uh, an albatross around your neck, so to speak, on the battlefield, or is it going to be something that's going to contribute to your combat capability? I'm not suggesting that the Ukrainians can't operate the systems that they're provided. I'm just suggesting that these are the kinds of things that have to be part of that conversation. So again, we're going to continue to work closely with them. We're going to continue to work closely with our partners and allies to determine how we can best support them based on the conditions on the ground to, to give them the best chance of success. Do you, do you think the M1 would be an albatross around the Ukrainian's neck if it were provided? Again, I'm not going to speculate about the future. I'm going to talk about right now. Don't have anything to announce. I mean, we provided $24 billion worth of security assistance. Uh, I'm sure no one anywhere would doubt our commitment to supporting Ukraine and the capabilities that, that we've given them. And we're going to remain focused on doing that and giving them whatever it is that they need at this moment in time based on the situation on the ground to be effective. Thank you. Let me go back out to the phone here. Got uh, Sean from National Defense. Yep. Thanks, Pat. Uh, so one of the problems that was or, or concerns raised last year by members of Congress was oversight of the support to Ukraine. 
And obviously after Iraq, Afghanistan, there are a lot of concerns, Inspector General findings. Can you address what the department is doing regarding oversight of support to Ukraine in light of any lessons learned from the previous conflicts? Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, you know, we've, we've been uh, very public in terms of the steps that we've taken, uh, working closely with State Department and Ukraine uh, in terms of uh, monitoring of the of the equipment uh, that we've provided to them, uh, as well as being responsive to Congress uh, when it comes to oversight of the capabilities uh, that, that we've provided. And so we will continue to, to do that. We look forward to working with the Congress uh, and to uh, the, the strong bipartisan support that we've received to this stage. Thank you. All right, let me just do a couple more, sir, and then back here. Thank you, sir. Uh, I had a question on the Tomahawk, the Tomahawk missiles that Japan has been looking to purchase. Um, I understand that there was nothing publicly released concerning this yesterday uh, after the 2 plus 2. Could we expect some kind of deal or purchase to be done today with uh, Secretary Austin and Defense Minister Hawada? Or will there be an announcement concerning these missiles at all? Yeah, thanks very much. So uh, I don't have anything to announce regarding foreign military sales. I'd refer you to State Department on, on that. Thank you. Sir. General, uh, General, do you have any update on Iranian support um, to Russia? Especially uh, recently, the Ukraine have said that Iran may send more drones uh, to Russia in the near future. Any steps uh, to stop that uh, supporting? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, so we do know, you know, obviously that Iran has provided drones to Russia for use in Ukraine. Uh, we do know that there's Russian intent to acquire more of those drones. I don't have any updates to provide in terms of, uh, you know, the, the levels of or the numbers rather that they've provided beyond the hundreds we've talked about before. Um, and again, um, working with the interagency on uh, you know, what, what types of sanctions might be applied to prevent Iran from doing that, um, but I don't have anything beyond that. Thank you. All right, more time for one more and then we'll call it a day. Yes, ma'am. Um, so just to go back to what the Secretary of the Navy said. Um, so beyond the Secretary of the Navy, multiple comments were made by Navy officials about industry's timelines and delays in industry. Is that a concern shared by the Pentagon? And is there any concern that supplies to Ukraine is being prioritized over supplies for the United States military? Uh, again, we're not going to do anything that's going to prevent us from being able to meet our national security requirements. And as I highlighted, uh, the Department of Defense is working very closely with the industry to identify what our needs and our requirements are. Uh, and we're confident that, you know, given the robust uh, industrial base that we have, uh, that we'll be able to work through those challenges and make sure that we can replenish our stocks, uh, you know, in addition to working closely with our allies and partners around the world on the same uh, problem set. So thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.